Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum, and today we are embarking on another path, Greg. We're going down the path of nuclear bombers. And why are we doing that? Because a lot of discussion has been going on recently about nuclear bombers and Russia and all this other fun stuff going on. So we're gonna take a walk down nuclear bomber lane, which is exciting. My Lugan assistant is with me today. I'm not sure, is this a Fez? I, I, I'm not really sure if this is a Fez or not. Perhaps he's got me quaffed in a very interesting hat. Certainly one of the more sedate hats that he's given me as of late. Another perfect catch from the Kenny. Now the aircraft that we're gonna get into today, honestly, is one of the prettiest, if you can call it that, a warplane pretty. This is one of the prettiest aircraft I have ever seen. And actually, I remember, and I don't know the name of the movie, but the movie that Jimmy Stewart was in when he was flying these, and then I think they were flying B-36s, although all those old movies run together. But this, this is just a gorgeous aircraft. This is the B-47, the Stratajet or the Boeing, the Model 450, as they would call it. Now, I'm gonna throw up a plan view of this airplane. The, it, this is the step, and this, the flight, first flight of this aircraft was in 1947. This is really the first step out of, like I'm standing in front of another Boeing product, I'm standing in front of the movie Memphis Bell aircraft, but this is the first step into the jet age, and man, did Boeing go at it with a vicious uh, design. This design here, Greg, this aircraft is so aerodynamically slick that on some approaches, when they would be coming in, the pilots would have to actually drop the back landing gear to slow the aircraft down on approach street speed, and they would still use use a drag chute when landing. The airplane was extremely difficult um, because it was just so clean. Um, and so they really did their job well with this aircraft. As I said, it first flew in 1947. It was introduced in 1951. Um, it was retired in 1969, the bomber version of the airplane. And in 1977, the electronic warfare, the EB, 47E was retired. Uh, the competition that they started out with was the North American, the XB-45, the Convair, the XB-46, and the Martin XB-48. Now, original design on this airplane, or original thought process with Boeing, was that they were just gonna take a B-29 with a straight wing and strap jet engines to it. That was the idea, just change out the plants, make the airplane a little bit bigger, but, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a lot of fun with this because I'm not gonna pronounce this the right way, but the von Karman mission to the German Aerodynamics Lab at Brunnischwig, hopefully I got that right, uh, just changed everything. When, as the Germans, and we've talked about before, the usual suspects, when the Americans saw what the Germans were doing, uh, they said basically, hold the phone, stop the presses. We're not going any further forward. They got out a clean sheet of paper. Um, there was a guy by the name of R.T. Jones at Langley that had a theory about swept wings in that time, at that time and how they were able to change the speed and the lift characteristics of the airplane, but he wasn't taken seriously until they got into this German experimental lab and looked at what the Germans were doing and went, oh, well, they're light years ahead of where we are. So they went back to the, to the um, drawing board on this airplane, and what ended up happening is a guy by the name of Vic Ganser at Boeing came up with the perfect sweep on these aircraft, which is 35 degrees, on this particular aircraft, which is 35 degrees. Um, so that's how it, it came to be. Now, how slick was this airplane? Chuck Yeager didn't like flying this airplane because, again, he had problems slowing it down. It had some interesting characteristics. One of the things, 
And Bob Friend, who's our Tuskegee who has passed on, we fly his P-51, flew this airplane, and he flew the airplane in the loft maneuver when they were throwing the bomb, where they would literally throw the bomb out of the airplane and kind of lob it at the target. He would tell me stories of essentially when they were doing that in the cockpit, they were head down in the cockpit and they were looking at a G meter because they knew how many Gs they had to pull to get through the loop. And if there were too little Gs, obviously the aircraft would not make it and stall. If it was too many, they would rip the wings off the airplane. So the entire time that they were in that maneuver, they were basically watching they weren't even looking outside. They were watching the G-meter as the airplane would do the maneuver. Now, the Air Force thought about that, and after a lot of conversation, what was a problem with this airplane, Greg? These wings, have you ever been on an airliner and the wings flex? Well, these wings on this aircraft, these little thin wings, flexed a whole bunch. And so what ended up happening was that the... Uh, the Air Force looked at that and said, we're gonna basically have a service life on these things of about five years if we keep doing that because of the wear on them. And they got rid of that. And then they got into pretty much low level uh, pop-up where they would pop up and drop the bomb out to you know, penetration, especially as Soviet air defenses got much better. But Bob would tell me that they would come back and count the number of rivets that were missing in the airplane. That was how stressful it, it was on the aircraft. So, so that, it, you know, and then later in life, one of the things, and I want to say that the air crews called it a Coke bottle repair, but they actually came in on the wing roots and put a, essentially a, a bigger bolt or a bigger appendage to where the wing bolted to the fuselage because of the amount of flex that the airplane had. And they did have failures where these, the wings literally came off the airplane. Now, when you talk to air crews about this aircraft, they will tell you a couple of things. One, they either loved it, or two, they hated it. The airplane was known as a maintenance hog. It used a lot of maintenance time. Uh, and either air crews actually either actually thought it was the best thing since sliced bread, or they were very concerned uh, about basically the wings falling off the airplane. They just didn't like it. So the bomber force of this version stayed and was essentially the backbone of the Strategic Air Command, the nuclear side of Strategic Air Command, up until about 1959, and then what came in to replace it? The B-52. B-52 came in to replace it, and the crews generally, because of the higher crew complement and the lighter workload, actually liked the B-52 better. We have to talk, we, we have to give credit where credit is due. Now, Greg, one of the things about this airplane, if you look at it, you're going, this is just an aerodynamically beautiful airplane, right? You would never have a problem with this airplane at altitude. You would be wrong. Because when the airplane got up at about 35,000 feet, what happened? I've talked about this before, coffin corner, where the airspeed and the stall speed on the wing get to the point where the airplane under load, when it has a load, it can no longer stay aloft because uh, it doesn't generate enough lift across the wing to, to keep the airplane in the air. That's called a coffin corner, a very simple coffin corner. And we've talked about that. You can throw up something if you want, Greg. But the, when this airplane got up at 35,000 feet, the way the wing was designed, the wing did not have enough wing area at the thin air at that speed to keep the airplane aloft. And so a couple things happened. They had to, to they, the fuel economy would fall off on the airplane, so they'd have fuel issues with the airplane and they had a real chance that the airplane was going to stall at that altitude. So they brought it back down to those intermediate altitudes, and ultimately that's why they brought it back down and used it more as a lower level penetrator. But you wouldn't want to fly at a SAM site, a Soviet SAM site in the middle to late 50s at 35,000 feet. This airplane would be a sitting dock with its size and, and, uh, and just its total radar signature. Now, what I want to do today 
on my salute is I am going to, now Greg, I did this to myself. I was in Sedona, I was shopping in Sedona at this little shop, and they had some interesting sodas that I brought back for you. You have faithfully kept them cold. And so today I'm gonna to have the Reading Draft Blueberry Birch, handcrafted since 1921. Now this gentleman who owns this little shop in Sedona told me that he actually imports this stuff. Apparently it doesn't come in from where, wherever it is manufactured. And, and it's the only place you can get it like west of the Mississippi. So uh, that was why I chose it. It has 170 calories. It's caffeine free, pure cane sugar. He is part of the pure cane sugar mafia, uh, but it looks good. It's kind of interesting. This has got to be the color of like de-icing fluid, doesn't it? So we're going to go ahead and pop this. But what I want to salute today is these sack crews that flew these aircraft and the people that were involved in this particular, in the B-47, kept the peace. And at a very volatile time, if you think about Nikita Khrushchev and all the things going on with the Soviet Union, this was an extremely important part of the nuclear triad. I think we overlook the fact of all those cold warriors that were in this equipment, and we're gonna talk about some of them that paid the price with this airplane, uh, that went out every day strapped on a, a multi-kiloton nuclear bomb and didn't know where they were going to come back, but they buffaloed the enemy enough or made the enemy think about a mutually assured destruction enough that the war never happened. So to all of the B-47 strategy air crews, the folks at Boeing that built it, um, and anyone that was involved in maintaining it, I salute you. You know what it's like, uh, honestly, it's like cotton candy. If I'm going to tell you the taste, that's what it tastes, very syrupy. But um, if you might like this, again, it's not my taste. It is not the de-icing fluid that you normally give me, so I maybe preserve my own life for a period of time. So we'll put this over here, get this aircraft back out. So. It had, some, it had some quirky things about it. It was also involved in one of the more notable Broken Arrow incidents. And this aircraft in Georgia was out on some sort of training mission and it collided with an F-86. When it collided with the F-86, the B-47 crew jettisoned the bomb. That bomb has never been found to this day. So somewhere out there in Georgia, there is a nuclear weapon. I think I have my notes here. Let's see, uh, where was it? A Mark 15. So for you nuclear weapon aficionados at home, a Mark 15 nuclear weapon is somewhere in Georgia. I think it's actually off the coast of Georgia, if I'm correct. I could be wrong. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on that, because I'm not totally clear on the incident, but I do know it was one of the few Broken Arrow incidents we've had where we've never recovered the nuke. So, the aircraft we said, the electronic warfare versions of this airplane soldiered on, and they did. They were the ones that really took the brunt of the uh, Soviet ire, if you want to call that the Russian ire. They were fired on numerous times. A number of these aircraft were shot down. And when you flew at that time and you were flying in electronic warfare or these black missions, you know, where you're, you were basically disavowed if you were captured. And so the air crews many times never were seen again. Many of the airplanes came back with their tail feathers shot up, the vertical and the horizontal stabilizers shot up, and the Russians did not hesitate to fire on these airplanes. They, they would... Uh, they would do it without question. Now, for those of you who are, well, that's kind of interesting, Fred, I want to point you to a RAND report right after the fall of the Soviet Union. I want to say it's in the late 90s, early 2000 that documents a lot of these aircraft. 
And there are really good historical records that some of these air crews were actually captured and that what they, they were done is they would use them as mirrors. They would interrogate them and then um, basically you went to a gulag and you never came back. And I have never talked to a B, uh, B-47 crew, but I did talk to a B-52 commander that told me that if they were told quite specifically if you were ever in, shot down over North Vietnam and you were interrogated by a Chinese or a Russian officer that were in the room, that that was the signal that you were going to get uh, sent somewhere else and never to return. Fortunately, that didn't happen with this guy, but remember that was the, the Cold War. The last flight of this aircraft was in 1986. When I think that one went up to Castle Air Force Base, it was an eventful flight. They actually flew it out. We like when we move these big airplanes, we like to fly them various places as opposed to take the wings off and haul them around multiple trucks. Military doesn't like that with, uh, with uh, big airplanes. I, I bet you, Greg, that'll be the last time you ever see a museum piece or a boneyard piece other than for their own use, like that B-52 it was just taken out of the boneyard and refurbished that B-52H. I don't think you'll ever see these move around when they're going to museums. They'll go in or uh, to trucks. Now, for those of you who are keeping score at home, the comparable aircraft, and some of them we've mentioned to this one, are the Vulcan, the XB-46, the Victor, the XB-48, the B-45, the Russian, the Tu-16, and the Valiant. So the, there was a whole bunch of aircraft that were in this performance range and envelope at that time in the Cold War. But nonetheless, this is a fasc fascinating airplane. I, you know, Greg, if I could own an airplane and I didn't have to worry about maintenance and everything else, this would probably be the airplane I would own. I really think it's a cool airplane. We could fly around, do Warbird Wednesday all over the world, Greg is starting to look like he's getting sick, I think, behind the camera there. Now, if you want to have a piece of Boeing, by the way, I have one of these. This is a nice travel bag. This is a really nice travel bag. It has the Boeing Company logo on it. Go out to our website and you can pretend that you are a Boeing B-47 flight test engineer and fly around with that beautiful bag. It is a very nice travel bag. That'll be on the link to the video. If you have come across us on these videos, all we do are military aircraft, give us a like, give us a comment. Uh, if you're on YouTube, give us a like and a comment on Facebook. If you know somebody that just eats and breathes military airplanes, send a link to them. Hopefully they like, they like what we do. And lastly, we cannot do all of this. And you cannot see all the way around me in here. There's a lot of aircraft in here. We cannot preserve them and fly them without your generous support. So click on the link that's on this video to make a donation. We could certainly appreciate it. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day.